Anyway, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. This is, I know it's not our first KWM tasting, but it's the first one that I have been present for. Um, although not in Calgary, um, I'm somewhere a little warmer right now, so don't hate me. Um, but I am taking a night away from, from said vacation to enjoy some incredible whiskeys with all of y'all. Uh, and if you don't mind, I know, Deb, this came up last time. Uh, we will not broadcast any of you. I know we're live streaming and recording the tasting, but the only two people whose faces will get seen are myself and Deb from Glen Farkless. But I remember last time you'd made a comment and I, I kind of feel this way too. It's nice to see the faces of the people you're talking to, if you don't mind. Um, if you do, that's fine. You can leave your camera off, but uh, uh, there you have it. If you didn't get the order of the whiskeys for tonight, I put it into the chat in the waiting room. It's there. We've monkeyed about a bit with this. I actually don't know what my staff sent out or if Evan sent a proposed order. He might have. Um, but Deb and I have decided we wanted to put these whiskeys in an order that made more sense. So um, we're going to start with the two oldest, partly because they're four fill casks and they're going to be a bit more delicate. Uh, then we're going to move on to the 92 the 94, the 93, the 1991, and then we're going to finish, or the, sorry, the 2002, then we're going to finish with the 1991. So um, the reason we decided to do the order that way is just that the last two whiskeys especially are very sherried. Um, the ones in the middle, moderately so, but they're also um, a bit younger and a bit higher in ABV. So we put the light and delicate at the start, and that's how we're going to do it. So um it's a lovely Friday evening uh, where I am. I know, Deb, it is tomorrow. It's a Saturday morning where you are. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah. I, I mean, we 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 didn't see you all that long ago. I think it was November. Uh, you came for the mildest November, December in a very long time. And thank God you're not in Calgary right now. Absolutely. I mean, it was bad enough in Ballandalic today at the distillery. Um, and it was only minus two there. So I've seen the temperature in Calgary right now. I'm yeah, it's, no. It's 37 degrees, going to be 37 degrees colder than that tonight in Calgary. Oof. So I think after a certain point, you just stop counting. You just, it's cold. You just accept it and you move on. But can you do the really fun thing where you throw a glass of water and it freezes? Oh, you, you could. But I mean, I think people who live in Alberta, like, that's not the first thing we think of doing. <laughs> um, I'm sure if we have people visiting from somewhere not used to that level of cold, then sure, we might think that's a fun parlor trick to trot out but no you just get on with life because that's what you have to do and drive very very carefully i guess uh, well, it depends on the roads and because yeah. i'm not there i can't speak to that today so <laughs> who knows anyway it's cold in canada a little bit less cold in scotland and not so cold where i am but that's not why we're here we're here to drink some whiskey so uh deb um before we dig into these family cast bottlings tonight uh, I think one thing that would be fun, I think most people on tonight's tasting probably know a fair bit about Glen Farkless, but uh, the origin of the, the family casks, which are now almost 15-ish years, like they got to be close to 15 years old now. Uh, 17 this year, 17, 17 years. years this year, yeah. Incredible. Um, it, it's a fun one. The origins, of course, actually go back an awful lot further than 17 years, though. They go back to the 50s, really, because... Way back in the 50s, when whiskey was really getting going again post-World War II, lots of distilleries said, yes, let's make whiskey again. Wonderful, we're allowed to. And then very quickly realised they were making too much. And actually, the, the demand was not there yet post-war. The country was not in a position to actually be buying these whiskies. So distilleries then start to slow down again. But we're very lucky that with us... Um, the fourth generation of the Grant family who have owned a distillery now since 1865, the fourth generation there, a gentleman called George Grant, he said, oh, we'll keep making whiskey. We'll use it one day. So they kept filling casks and filling casks. For sure, not maybe not the quantities that we're doing today. In fact, definitely not the quantities we're doing today. But um, they certainly were doing enough that we still have casks today from the 50s. And that's the the start point of the family cask range. Um, when they first launched family casks in 1990, uh, 2007, 1952 was the oldest. 
1994 was the youngest. That was the opening range. Mm -hmm. Over the years, that has developed and developed. So 52 and 53 have been lost, sadly. But 1954 is still there. You can still buy that one. Um, and every year we add the next one. So what happens mm -hmm. is during the Spirit of Speyside Whiskey Festival in May, we will select the first 2009 family cask. So whatever age would be a 15-year-old gets added on each year. So 2009 will get selected on the 6th of May this year. And um, that's done by, it's the only time we ever let members of the public get involved. So we'll let members of the public come in, um, do a tasting for about 25 people. We'll give them six different whiskies from 2009 and we'll do a vote. Whichever one wins the vote will be bottled as the first 2009 family cask. Um, it's a fun way of doing it. Yeah. Well, you know, we used to do something back in the day when, uh, um, and I'm, I'm not pointing fingers at you or anybody, but the industry, things were different 15 years ago when I was selecting a cask. Like sometimes... I would get sent six full-size bottles of cask samples to pick a cask. And this gave rise at one point to this idea I had called whiskey democracy, where I would, I would invite customers to come and do a tasting at the store where they would literally help me pick the cask. And at the end of the day, I would still make a decision that I felt was the best one, but like we had all this liquid. So it was like, well, we might as well share it with people. Absolutely. Um, over t over time, those cast samples kept shrinking. S some are like very small these days, like ten c, like no, like like one point five cl. It's really hard oh, to wow. choose a cask with one point five cl. But time times change. Our standard would be a hundred mils, so ten cl. Yeah. So quite simply, because um, you can carry that in hand luggage on an airplane. Yeah, and you know so what? hundred like cl's great. But yeah, I, the... I found myself um, in in a hotel in Edinburgh after inviting my French distributor to Scotland versus France at rugby in John Grant's seats. And I went down to breakfast with 600 mil cast samples and said, I don't care if you have to throw out your own toiletries, you're taking these back to France. Because since Brexit, it's so hard to send them to France. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, 100 mils is allowed for, for that reason. So that tends to be our size. I've got slightly bigger than that for today, though. But anyway, you're to not, go back to the actual flexing. Yeah, not, not much. But to go back to I've got to give them back is the difference. Um to go back to so when we first launched the family cast back in 2007, as I say, it was 52 to 1994. Um people asked the question at that time because you've got to remember, even 2007, the market wasn't what it is today in terms of interest, in terms of collecting, all that kind of thing. So the question was asked, why? Why on earth would you do this? And the response was, because we can mm -hmm. and no one else can. Mm -hmm. So talking about flexing, you know, no one else had every single year available. Um, that original set retailed for about £15,000 in the very first release. Now, as I say, you don't get 52 and 53. You do get more younger ones nowadays. But if you want them all, you're looking at more than £155,000 from our visitor centre. Mm -hmm. It's it, just brought up an interest and price just a little bit. Well, it, I, I think there was an interesting contrast at the time because a lot of other people, and I know we need to get into that first whiskey, and I promise we will in, in two minutes, but for those who don't fully appreciate how unique, even at that time it was, for a single company to have every single vintage in a 52 year span uh, available to bottle like no one else could could do that i mean maybe william grants possibly maybe could have and they just never told anyone they've got stuff stashed away but if if they did they i think they would have by now and the I one that people have, were really two years missing yeah and the one that people were losing their minds over was mccallan and they granted had things from 1926 to I think the nineties, but there was lots of gaps there. A lot of those were bought back from Gordon McPhail. And then some others were actually like bottlings of bottled whiskey that they just bought and then rebottled in McAllen packaging. So 
I mean, I think for those of us who sort of understood, even at the time, like 17 years ago, how crazy this was, it was still pretty mind blowing. And, you know, in retrospect, I think if you had uh, the equivalent of, I think, about $30,000 to burn on a set of whiskey Canadian back then, like you would have quintupled your money by now at least. So, I, uh, so many people say to me, I regret. I was given the chance at the time and I thought, that's a crazy amount of money. And now look at it. <laughs> yeah. But hindsight is twenty twenty, And absolutely, um, let's dip in. The first whiskey we have tonight uh, is a 1979. Um, this vintage is personal to me because my brother, my younger brother is 1979. Uh, I'm a 78. Um, I did buy some 1979 bottlings for him over the years, but I've, I've stopped for a little while now because the prices are there. Um, and I, I do love him, but he's, he's more of a quality quantity over quality sort of fellow. And I'm not sure that a $2,000 bottle is really uh, going to, yeah, I, th I, th I think he would appreciate a hundred dollar bottle or a $200 bottle just as much, but, uh, I love these $10, two hundred dollar bottles. What's that? Ten two hundred dollar bottles instead. Exactly. <laughs> well, I love these, but I love these 1978, 79 family casks because a lot of them are refill. And I know they're they're always declared fourth fill, but fourth fill can, you know, and we've talked about this with you and other tastings, Deb can doesn't necessarily mean fourth fill. It could mean they don't know how many times it's been reused, but it's a cask that's been reused several times and in this one it, in this one it definitely will be um so talking before about the 50s when you know down times in the industry and not, people blew back in production late 70s early 80s were the same so mm -hmm. um that's why the casks they were using whatever was available they weren't necessarily thinking about the fact that in 43 years time we'd be sitting here on, online on a tasting um discussing exactly which cask choice was made in 1979 but the it, yeah so we were in a very privileged position that we did still make whiskey every year but for sure we weren't making the quantities at all nothing like the quantities that mm -hmm. we're making today. even what they were selling for blending was much less and so that's why there was there wasn't the money at that time to invest in casks, which is mm -hmm. why they tend to be third and fourth. Well, they weren't buying any new casks. It well, it makes me wonder, Deb, if uh, what was happening was some of the family businesses like Glen Farkless saw what was coming sooner than the others, because you look at like this the, the seminal year for Scotch whiskey when things really turned and went south is nineteen eighty three. And the smart companies like Gordon McPhail or, or the, like the original, the Douglas Langs of the world started buying casks when everyone started liquidating. But it would make sense that if you're just ahead of the peak, maybe sherry casks are at like all time highs that- Less now, know, but previous all time highs. <laughs> a previous all time high, the grants <laughs> stopped buying sh like sherry casks and just yeah. fill refills because- yeah. I haven't seen a single sherry bomb from 78 or 79. Um, I've not paid as much attention to the 1980s, but the 78s and 79s, there's never been a sherry bomb. It is similar for the first couple of years, the 80s as well. But by the time you get to mid 80s, we start to see a bit more first full sherry coming back in. Um, for example, I'm just having a look at the S22 release. There was an 85 done last year and it was a refill sherry. So a second full sherry hogshead. Mm -hmm. Which actually would be really uh good, I, think, I, I bet. <laughs> It, it might yeah um i i love this style of whiskey old refill casks um the reason i like the style so much is that the oak influence isn't so dominant you're not getting tons of sherry in there you're getting more of an opportunity for oxidation there's That's definitely fair. still sherry cask notes in there but they're subtle they're delicate and you're you're getting more of those tropical oxidative fruit notes that you get from long term maturation absolutely this one was distilled, if you want to get all the details, on the on the 5th of April, 1979. Mm. Um, which made it 43 years old on its date of bottling. Um, Bernadette asked, when did we start allowing the public to choose the cask? It's been a good few years that we've been doing this event at the Spirit of Speyside. Certainly since before I started, and I've been there six years already. So... 
Um, it's been a while. Um, it's always fun. So for those of you who don't know about the Spirit of Speyside Whiskey Festival, it's held every year at the beginning of May. And we do all sorts of weird and wonderful things during the Whiskey Festival that we don't do at normal times. And this is one of them. Um, one of the other ones is we allow people to have breakfast in our still house, which the Fisky people absolutely love. Um, so actually, we had a meeting just this week about what we're going to do for, for this year's Spirit of Speyside because we've got until Tuesday to give them all our events. And so the breakfast is definitely happening again. Um, and... 30 people it has to be the Sunday morning because it's the only time the stills are off you would not want to eat breakfast sitting next to stills if they're actually running um, it's just a little bit warm and unpleasant in there they were they'd probably start distillation again today actually I guess uh, we shut down properly completely for Christmas so they started the production again on Tuesday mashing so they should have been distilling today um, mm -hmm. It's it's not an easy thing to shut down a distillery like Glenfarclas simply because it gets not Calgary cold, but still cold enough that frozen pipes are a, a genuine issue. So then once you get starting again, it's a it's a it's a gradual step by step process. You don't want to turn everything. You don't off have central time. heating. I mean, I'll give you a laugh. You 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 know, Andrew, you do not need central heating when the distillery is in operation. But um, apparently, the gas line froze. In the, in the first really cold spell, spell we had at the start of December, and the guys thought that maybe a blowtorch would be a good thing to use to try and defrost it. Yeah, that's they not a good idea. It. They didn't do it, but there was a, yeah. there was a. How about no? Maybe not. This is not a good idea. Yeah, that's that's how to get one of those. You know, how many days on this job site without an injury <laughs> signs put up? Somewhere, <laughs> um, I think is the outcome from that. Uh, all right. Um, so breakfast in the distillery, I would imagine you're not doing a pancake breakfast a la the Calgary Stampede, but nope. uh, more bacon bunnies. Oh, full Scottish. Yeah. Haggis as well. Haggis. Glenfarclas oh. haggis. Wonderful. The, 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 the haggis which contains some 105. I don't know if I've had Glenfarclas haggis. I, I do love haggis. Surely. So I don't think I, I have. I mean, I would take some over for you next time, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to legally bring it into the country, right? If if they don't ask and you don't tell, then what's the harm? I say. And uh, marmalade and fudge. Yeah. So yeah, these are the things. So we still we still have in our gift shop honey, marmalade, fudge, and haggis. Those are the four foods that we still produce. Amazing. Well, yeah, no, I I would love to try the haggis someday. So we'll just we'll just put that in the on the bucket list. Um, we should probably move on to the 1983. Absolutely. Now, this is the only one in the lineup, and the labels on the bottle are not correct. It says that it's an S22 release. It is not. Um, it's a, actually a winter 2018 release. So it is a, a release from about five years ago. And you'll note it's more expensive than the 1979, which raises all kinds of questions that I'm sure Deb can answer for us because... Um, some vintages are more rare than others, and there's a reason yeah. why they're priced that way. So, Deb, why, I'll pull up the screen. Do you want to start us off on the 83? So the very simple answer to that is they're priced according to how many casks we still have from any vintage in the warehouse. So it used to be that as soon as a vintage sold out or came close to being sold out, we would bottle the next cask from that year. But a few years ago, in fact, around the time that I started, it became clear that that wasn't something we could keep doing forever because availability of casks meant that there were holes starting to come into the lineup. And what we also find is because of the two cask type, types we're using between the hogsheads and the um, sherry butts, there is a difference between how those age. So obviously hogsheads mature faster because they're smaller, but they also, you end up with an overall bigger loss of alcohol in general there are exceptions to every rule but in general you'll find hogsheads lose more alcohol um during their maturation and we find that some casks from that kind of time maybe not quite early 80s but your kind of late 70s casks nowadays are actually getting pretty close to you know no longer strong enough which is a bit of an issue um 
but with these casts from the early 80s, like you said yourself, Andrew, you know, those, this was really the, the big drop in terms of whiskey. So we are mm. down to our last casks from those years. So 84, mm. there's none left. 83, I think this was maybe the second last cask um, when we bottled it. So, yeah, we are down to the wire almost in terms of what we've got. So the pricing reflects that. When we looked at the lists, we decided to stop bottling or stop rebottling 76 and older. So once those casks are gone, once those bottles are gone, sorry, they are gone and they will never be replaced. Um, mm -hmm. And 77 and younger, if we still have them, we'll still replace them, but it's not everything we still have. Yeah, and, uh, and I imagine even those are going to start getting more scarce yeah. with time especially early 80s so if you look at our price list in the visitor center because obviously it's one of the few places that we do have everything 83 84 those are much more expensive and then 85 86 are a bit more reasonable mm -hmm. um i have a stock list here i'm just trying to find it make sure i'm not telling lies about how much 83 we've got <laughs> obviously because we're so modern at, at uh cliff Arkless, it literally just P um, photos of pages <laughs> 83 well yep. you know what it's hard to hack those so, it is very hard to hack those there is um, one more cask left from 83 and that's it there's no 82 left there's no 84 left oh well so. um i I've, I've been lucky i think i've got about five different 1978s tucked aside um the first one was i think it was only in it's like the very first release it was probably 30 or maybe not even 30 years of age, the very first 78. So uh, yeah, I've been lucky to, to to snag a few over the years. So what, what I noticed when I was looking up the details from this cask though, it's cask number 28, but it's distillation date is the 9th of March. Now, I just assumed when I saw cask number 28, this was gonna be a January cask. So the fact that we didn't, we'd only filled twenty-seven casks by the 9th of March tells you how little production was happening in March compared to usual. I mean, I'm saying that I could be wrong. It could be that literally everything was going to blenders and we weren't keeping any of it for ourselves until March. That is also possible, um, mm -hmm. but it's much more likely that, well, they just had had cut it back so much that production was at a much lower level than it is now we've already filled no, let's say we haven't filled more than that yet but this time next week i'm fairly sure we'll have already filled more than that this year uh so this particular one 35 years of age um you you mentioned before this is just a refill hoggy it's not the yeah. second fill 48.8 percent uh i don't know if i've this might be one of the first 83s i've had um, again, partly for selfish reasons, whenever there was a chance to do a tasting, I would usually gravitate towards the 77, 78, 79. Um, and because we've done can't... a lot of, a, a lot of the bottlings from the, from 89 to the 90, mid nineties, which seemed to be a nice little sweet spot for Sherry with Glenn Farkless. But, uh, 83, I think this one's new to me. So yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a refill hog's head. So it's a third fill. Oh, it's third fill. Okay. Yeah. It's got some nice chocolate tones to it. There is some nice fruit in there. So what's, I mean, this is what I was saying before about, you know, how different casks age differently. 272 bottles is quite a lot for a 35-year-old oh, hogshead. head. Um, no. But 48.8 is quite low. So obviously this one was holding its overall volume, mm. but losing quite a lot of strength. Possibly maybe thicker staves, yeah. better Cooper cask. Um, I mean, it, that brings up an interesting point because uh, Glen Farkless is a little unique. And when you talk about um, single casks, uh, some companies, we won't know it, name any names, over the years will marry together the same vintage and still call it a single cask. And I, I suppose you could argue at the time of bottling, it, it is still a single cask. But I'm guessing I know the answer to this question because Glen Farkless doesn't finish its whiskey. Ever. So I'd imagine you're probably, you probably would never have been re-racking vintages to try to, you know, narrow down the, the number you had if the volume in some was dipping. 
No, the only time that the, like the only time we'd read rack really will be if there's a genuine problem with a cask, you know, mm-hmm. a leaking cask or that kind of thing. Yeah, but otherwise, no, we just leave them as they are. Um, so, certainly not for anything we're actually going to put our own name on anyway. I'm not mm-hmm. saying these things never happen for other things that ha- exist at the distillery that mm-hmm. we store for other people, for example, but mm-hmm. anything that we're going to be selling underneath their own name. Mm-hmm. Well, um, this has got a really lovely palette to it. Some nice berry fruits, chocolate. Very different it's, though. It is. It's not as tropical as the, the 79. No. Um, and there's almost a like there's a there's a there's a funkiness to it, like an earthy, yeah. funky note to it. Like also like that kind of, of a grassy mushroom. kind of smell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Going a little bit maybe slightly barnyardy. Yeah. But not too far. <laughs> not too far. No, we wouldn't we would not want that. I mean, that does raise a question. Knowing that you don't finish casts, knowing that you don't re-rack. What happens if you come across a particularly janky cask in the warehouse, like just something that's not sellable? What do you do with that? Wow, there's a there's a hard question. <laughs> and I mean, with Cliff Farkless, this probably almost never happens, right? So I mean, uh, not very often, for sure. It's unlikely that it's going to be past the point of no return. Is it something we're just going to give more time to? Mm-hmm. Um, because if the cask was good enough, it is always, <laughs> yeah, Jeff, for sure. That's the one we had at Christmas. We drank it at the Christmas party on the twenty second December. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure the I'm pretty sure the staff would insist on a better cask than the janky one in the corner, though. That is also true. Yeah. Because especially the warehouse guys, they know where the really good stuff is. Mm-hmm. Um, no, because. It's, it's always really interesting, though. Um, I'm sure at some point, Andrew, you'll have done a cask selection with us actually at the distillery. Uh, well, the the interesting thing there is I've only, ever, samples. I've only ever done two proper casks. I've done about oh, six cask strength bottlings. We did a 15, a 1997 yeah. uh, in about 2012, I'm guessing, going going from memory here. So we have done a couple of um, single casks, but I don't think I chose that one at the distillery. I think samples were sent out for that. Because I mean, it's always great fun when, when people do want to come to the distillery and taste. Um, mostly because obviously it's all done in warehouses. So the casks are not more than three high. So you get people literally climbing. You'll have um, myself, sometimes Callum, Dr. Manager, if he's available. Um, the customer and one of the warehouse team because you need someone from the warehouse team to do the climbing because they will physically just climb up to the third level absolutely no osha you know health and safety again doesn't exist I'll sign just a climb up there it's fine um it's not that high i mean they are only three high but they will just climb up there and there's nothing worse than we'll say to them oh we've been told to look at stow 12 and they go to store 12 and it's like really tight and they can't actually get in between them um and that does happen sometimes but it's great fun to watch them monkeying up there and you know literally my job is to stand there with the glasses and just like pass them up to the uh whoever it is it's sometimes you and sometimes it's andrew depending on which of the warehouse guys is in the mood to be speaking to members of the public which isn't all of them all the time um and What's really interesting is quite often we'll look at like say three casks from the same day. And it is that contrast that, you know, they're all the same spirit. They're all the same cask type. They should all be the same, but they just aren't. And sometimes mm-hmm. you will find that one of the three just hasn't come on as far as the others. Now, single casks nowadays tend to be quite young simply because of where our sweet spot is in terms of availability for our customers. Um, so the casks might be kind of 11 12 13 year old hogsheads but a first full 11 year old hogshead can be absolutely fantastic it just depends on mm-hmm. the cast obviously but the occasional one like no actually it still really smells like the spirit it needs that bit more and um, time so mm-hmm. yeah time is always well, possible it, it sounds like the next time i'm over there we need to rummage through casks 
absolutely uh, looking for a teenage hogshead um in the new, new home tell people that they really need to not come at this time of year because oh. you can't smell anything at it's that temperature cold. it's too cold yeah. so we yeah. do have to say no how about we do this one later or Even... so either come from like april onwards or we have to be really boring and you know pull samples and do it inside mm -hmm. just not as much um... fun I, and as much as I would love to clamber over the casks, you probably don't need a 230-pound man. Oh, you'd be surprised because, I mean, things. I'm not saying anything anything bad about Ewan, but he's not the smallest guy. Uh, <laughs> fellow Clydesdale, it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> well, 83 was interesting. I'm I'm keen to move on to the, uh, the 92. Yeah. Um, now, while we're looking at that, uh, many of you may recall we bottled a 1992 cask uh, for our 30th anniversary, which Glenn Farkless was kind enough uh, to line up for us, which is sadly long gone um, and probably a good thing because the pricing on those 90, early 90s bottlings have really gone up in recent years. Yeah. Um, so this is the S22. I'm just pulling up the info here. It is Fourth fill butt, according to the paperwork, but it doesn't look like a fourth fill butt color-wise. 29 years old, 52.6%. And I'll share my screen here in just a second, everyone. So uh, the, all the kind of early 90s stuff have gone up, mostly because the these are now the equivalent of like 30-year-old. So a 30-year-old single mm -hmm. cask has to cost more than a regular 30-year-old. Um, when you've been bottling a cask every year almost for 15 years of most of these vintages like there's been a few gaps few years where you haven't done a, a an 89 90 91 or a 92 yeah. so i have to imagine that you know there there's less of them than there were there's certainly less of them there were and also because they are being used for 30 year old and, the, and of course the 35 year old that we had at the last tasting no, so and they're some of them, well. some of them are also being held back for forty-year-olds. Um, you know, and and I think that's one of the interesting things about this. Like we, you can tell us that you're running low on certain vintages, but I would imagine that sometimes that also means that there's certain years where maybe there are a handful of casks left, but you know you need them for forty-year-old, or you, you need stock to supply that in the years ahead, and. I imagine that that becomes a bit of a complicating factor when you're trying to figure out how much of each vintage you can actually bottle. Well, the classic example of that is 1953. So we pulled 1953 from the family cask range a good few years ago, uh, I guess about 2012, 2013, kind of five, six years in, they decided to, to pull the, the 53 out of that range. We still have casks from 1953, but the decision was taken that because those were the oldest casks we had, we should keep them for other things almost. So um, to be what was the 60 year old that was that was bottled a good few years ago now and what is going to be the 70 year old that we're bottling this year. Oh, is, that's that's not a secret anymore. That's that's it's not a secret. What exactly it's going to look like and how much it's going to, going to cost is still a secret. That it's going to happen is not a secret. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, too many people have been to the distillery and seen the cask in the warehouse and said, oh, look, a 1953 cask. What's that all about? Um, for us to be able to really call that secret anymore. Um, well, the, there, there was a time 15 plus years ago when I'm pretty sure I sampled a 52 or a 53. Um, again, different times. Uh, yeah. And there, I know there was a sad story with one of the last 1952s that basically the cask fell apart and it drained into the the earth um, after they'd opened it to sample it because the air pressure was apparently the only thing holding it together. And when they took the bung out to, to sample it, they didn't realize it at the time, but the cask basically just gave out. So I have every confidence the 53, that's not going to happen for the simple <laughs> reason that we have sampled it quite recently. So <laughs> um, it's in good shape. It's in good shape. But it actually, I'm not sure if we've actually bottled it or if it's, it's going to go and get bottled pretty soon. 
um the the thing is that so to, to it's kind of linked to what Jeff just asked the 53 the one we're, I'm talking about now that's sitting in warehouse one it's sitting about 41 ish percent ABV so obviously if that goes under 40 we're in trouble but what you've also got to remember is by the time it gets to 70 years old it's not losing two percent ABV a year if it's losing anything it's it's absolutely minimal um mm -hmm. so even though we haven't finalized design yet for this product it's very much in the works but it's not finalized that cask will go for bottling anytime now because it had its birthday end of november start of december so it mm -hmm. will go for bottling now we will bottle it into well i'll give you a laugh like this yeah a tall this round. is my free bottle that i got if you get one of these every month um so it'll get bottled into one just like this you know really expensive stuff and it will wait then for the decanters. But that means that we'll know the strength so we can engrave the decanters, but also mm -hmm. um, we know it won't lose that last little bit of alcohol, so we, we, we will be able to um, to keep it. Yeah. For the simple reason that it wouldn't be aging anymore. Well, you could, as long as it was over 70. So, yeah, so putting it into glass in the sense that we will bottle it into bottles, but you, we, we don't have any system like the cognac Dame Jean um, mm -hmm. I remember that argument with people when I went to cognac. They're like, "Oh, this cognac's 150 years old." And I'm like, "It's not really, though, is it? It's from 150 years ago. It's not actually 150. It's not been in a cask for 150 years. Oh, I suppose not." <laughs> yeah. Well, back to this 1992. So on paper, fourth fill. Yeah. Um, is this really fourth fill though? Like it, it's got some color to it it's got some sherry tones to it like there's some nice leather chocolate tobacco in there some nice candied fruit there's also a lot of sweetness as well which is uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's also got more of those sweeter notes that kind of almost like mm -hmm. yeah maybe it's a ca kind of candied candied fruits almost like a little bit bubble gum kind of mm -hmm. um it's possible the one i've got more doubt about is actually the next one i think Basically, if what happens is, you know, we have these records of all our casks and if we're not sure, we call it fourth fill. Now, it's going to be at least a third fill. We would know if it was first or second. Um, but if we're not 100% sure, we will call it fourth. But the other thing you also have to think, we're, it can be a fourth fill cask and be 25 years old. Mm -hmm. It can be a second fill cask and be 45 years old. You know, it it mm -hmm. it's, just depends how long those casks we're being used for although it will take more from the cask in the early years so each time you use it first couple of years mm -hmm. you're always going to take a bit from the cask um with i mean th this brings up possibly a difficult question to answer but uh when you look at say <laughs> so I'm, I'm only doing this purely because our conversation is leading my brain in different directions but Bear with me. Like, let's assume the seventy nine is a fourth fill cask. Yeah. Um. So it's forty three years in in that fourth fill. Do you guys have any sense of how long the prior maturations would have been? Like, you might it not have the whole history. No, it depends on the cask. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there were some amazing nineteen ninety four refill hoggies. I think they were, and they knew, like the warehouse guys knew exactly what the first fill had been and how long it had been. They're like, oh, those were used for 15 year old once and now they're they're kind of mm -hmm. um, 25, 26 years old at the time when we're looking at them in the warehouse um, mm -hmm. in, for that second fill. So like they know exactly what those were. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as well, of course, is when we started working with the same bodega, Mm -hmm. So we're kind of early nineties was when we started working with the bodega that we're still working with now, Jose Miguel Martin. So before that time, where even the sherry casks came from varied massively. Yeah. So some of them were very much traditional sherry casks. Early nineties was when they really started to do the whole kind of like seasoning casks and that kind of thing going forward. Mm -hmm. So all of that has changed obviously over the years, but sometimes the really old casks and by that i mean the ones from like the kind of 50s and even before that um 
some of them still have the, the original almost like burnished names of the show producers marked into them mm. yeah. but the new castles they don't have that at all yeah no i know i i, I know that with uh with both Glenn Farkless and with Gordon McPhail, which are two of the companies that have stocks of old whiskey, you could almost see a period where, and it must have stopped by the 60s, but there was a period when they would like bevel their names in. Like it wasn't even a stamp yeah. or a burn. Yeah. Actually take time to like etch the wood with the name of the company. And you can get a sense, but it, it's for me, it's an interesting thing to think back because he, even if those casts had been used for just five or 10 years leading up to the 1970s and being a fourth fill, um, that's pretty incredible. I mean, that th th those casts might have been from the 40s. Like the, yeah, for sure. Pre-World pre War, pre War II, yeah. No question. Um, and the way, obviously, the way those casts were being bought back in those days was totally different i mean obviously now it's quite straightforward we only buy from one place and it's a simple conversation that john has he hasn't actually mentioned when he's going to spain but he will be going to spain at some point soon um usually it's february um so that you can have a conversation with miguel about how many casks we're buying this year and how much we're paying for them so we're lucky we get our casts every year, but we don't get to say, you know, how much. We do say how much, but we don't get to actually have any say in how much we're actually paying. So a 1900 is currently, um, sorry, a, a new cast is currently 1900 euros, a new share but that's the price for this year. Um, so they've, they've basically doubled in price over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Deb, I'm not sure if this is something that you and I had talked about previously, but there does seem to be a bit of a leveling off at the very least uh, of the industry. And, you know, could that be maybe something that you guys see a change from in the future where there's an elasticity to demand and the industry is gonna say well you know what we we'd love to buy the cast but we think you're asking too much because uh it seems like we've hit for certain things a bit of a tipping point in terms of demand and price elasticity with customers yeah no i, I definitely think that this last year saw a big change in in kind of patterns and that kind of thing but the casks themselves will still be in demand for the simple reason that there are so many new distilleries still coming online mm -hmm. now that have been in the planning for the last maybe three or four years that are now coming online that are now going to be desperate to get casks like these. Mm -hmm. um, because their whole thing is we need to get good casks immediately because they're going to want to put out their first whiskies yeah. in, in decent wood. Otherwise, they're really not going to do themselves any favours long term. No. But, but then that that presents another problem because if their input costs are higher than say even three or five years ago and the market is looking at first release bottlings at 60 plus pounds and saying, yeah, that's too much for a three-year-old, how are these guys going to pay for come that? Out with a, and how are they going to get 70 pounds a bottle to justify for their first release? Like I think... So yeah, maybe, maybe there's a few more years of runway because of that, but I have to imagine that at some point there's going to be a yeah, um, and it's going to trick. Maybe it'll take longer to triple to trickle down to the cask suppliers, but you know, there are there are cycles to everything, and it it kind of feels like that cycle is turning over. I think um, especially because so many of these newer distilleries are coming online now, even the Scottish ones, but not to mention so many from so many other countries as well. Mm -hmm. um, I can't keep track of all. It's impossible. There are just so many. Um, but I, and I saw actually online, I'm not going to mention any names, but kind of push back against the price of a first release from a new distillery um, just this week. And you think, well, 
how much you care about getting a bottle from release one. I think the Isle of Harris one did pretty well. Um, yeah. Everyone's yeah. quite happy with it, but it was another one that they have been compared to the, the Isle of Harris one. Well, the, the the Isle of Harris one's an interesting one, and it's it's we just we got it just before Christmas, um, but it's it's a bit frustrating I think for consumers too because their first release has like a dozen or more different batches. Right. So it's and not really so, the first. So release. so is is batch twelve of the first release still the first release, or is that batch twelve of? Is that actually the twelfth bottling? I mean, so you you run into situations like that. Uh, we'll see how they all play out, but I I think consumers are probably also getting wise to this inaugural release, first release, and I think some of these newer distilleries are finding okay, we sold our first one, but the second bottle is the harder to sell, and then the third's even harder. Hundred percent. But we're not here to talk about them. We're here to talk about Glen <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm enjoying that ninety two. Yeah. I'm, I have to say, and I'm a bit biased, I don't enjoy it quite as much as our 1992 that is now no longer available, but we'll let it's you still a nice that. cask. Yeah, it, well, it was still, it was your whiskey. So it was absolutely <laughs> it was really gorgeous good, whiskey. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was one of the privileges of my of my first trip out there to get to try that one. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that I, I was able to, to set aside a couple of those because uh, it's gorgeous. Um, all right, we're on to now the 1994. 1994 um, vintage for me is, uh, I think, a bit more hit and miss than the 90, 89, 90, 91, and the 92s. But um, you got to give them each its due. So let me find, oh, I'm going to have to pull that one up separately. I'll just pull it up here. But Deb, what can you tell us about the, uh, the 1994 while I'm looking for it? I would say it's not a fourth film. For a start it says it is but it really mm -hmm. does not smell like it um this one so again we're looking at 27 years old here mm -hmm. so we're quite bad at with forklifts about talking about catholics that they're young you know oh yeah it's just a 94 but actually yeah. Um, it's only it's only a ninety four. Only a ninety four. But yeah, this is this is one of the ones where I'm fairly sure we've called it a fourth fill, but it's actually not. Mm. Um, strength though, interesting. This one has really, really lost a lot of strength. So for uh, I'm looking at the right line here because that looks so low. Yeah, forty five point four. No, fifty three point eight. Now I'm looking at the wrong line. I think no fifty. Oh, I might have the wrong. I've got the wrong slide up. Hold on, I'm I'm the one yeah, who's gone. You're, you're one ahead here. of us here. I must have clicked on the wrong image. Uh, I'll uh, I'll figure My that out here. Hang still on. Has, has like kind of fast debris in it. <laughs> you you've got the 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 black adder the rock. I really mask. do. I really do. That's quite, that's usually you don't see so much of it in our ones, but that's quite a lot actually. Okay. Um, Here, here's the right one. We don't have bottles of every release of every vintage at the distillery, which is why I had to take, steal the samples and take them home. So every every cask that is selected for a family cask, we keep a sample like this um, and we'll keep it for a few years. And it's for things like this or if, for example, BC Liquor say, can we have tasting notes for that particular mm -hmm. vintage of that particular release um and also if there's any qc questions so we'll, we'll keep this for a couple of years and then if in three years time for example it's still there i might take it to whiskey life paris and have it underneath the counter to let you try you know these things never usually happen right andrew i'll, I'll be there again <laughs> um no they never they never happen it, it's an interesting profile because it's very dark, um, uh, moving really towards the licorice. You can tell it's oh, definitely it's not yeah. Fort Phil. Yeah, yeah, very chocolatey. But the low ABV is interesting. And I mean, what kind of an outturn did you get on that if your your ABV was that low? It's also low, which is why it's surprising. Usually you get one or the other, but it was 297 bottles. Mm. For a butt, that is really, yeah. really, really, really low. 
But um, it, it's got a inch. nice butteriness to it, some nice caramel tones in there too. Um, it's quite pretty. Um, and it's, yeah, there's a, there's a faint hint of a, like a farminess to it, but it, it works really well with, with everything and with the sherry like that. I think that's the barley coming through. Um, and I guess when you have a low ABV like that, when you are losing volume, um, you're going to get a situation where uh, you're probably going to get a bit more of an oxidative profile, especially if you're getting more, more air into the cast. So there's pros and cons. Especially, I mean, um, uh, 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 but that's going to be half empty by that point. So mm -hmm. loads and loads mm -hmm. of space. Um, as Harmony pointed out, I did got to put the right whiskey in the chat because I did get one ahead of myself a little earlier. There's the link for the 94. But yeah, that's an interesting bottling. It's a nice cask. It's got a more character to itself. it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think 1994. Where would I have been in 1994? I was starting um, high school. You're starting high school. I, I, was, I was firmly in high school. Um, it was the, it, well, the exciting year was the following year because I went to play rugby in England for two weeks and had to keep wiring home for money to pay for my beer, which <laughs> legally I probably shouldn't have been drinking, but it was a great time. Um, sadly, didn't get up to Scotland on that trip. Well, you, I think you probably made up for it since then. I more than made up for it since then, for sure. <laughs> Um, Harmony, Harmony says grade three or four. Hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. This, this is where you get really depressing. You see, my colleague Kirsten, who I work with directly, wasn't born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, there, there, there's, there's been people like that along the ways. Hunter, who uh, was a whiskey guy at our shop, quite a character for a number of years, started with us when he was 18 years and three months of age, and. For the entirety of his career, people would ask him if he was old enough to sell whiskey, which was was quite funny. I mean, um, I I feel the same way. I was I was eighteen and eight months when I had my, got my first job in the industry. So there you go. Was that that was was that a Glenfiddich or I can't remember. Yeah, you, you started yeah. was Glenfiddich. Yeah, all those years ago. First of June two thousand. There you go. Did not think this is where I'd end up. <laughs> same here, um, but anyway. Bernadette, a uh, uh, sherry butt around this age, you would probably expect to be closer to 400 bottles. And this mm -hmm. was under 300. So, because um, generally speaking, yeah. they do hold their strength and their volume better. Mm -hmm. um, but the there's always exceptions to that. And the exception can be as simple as the exact spot in the exact warehouse it was in you know if you if you get it in a really kind of damp dark corner then that's where you'll find ones that hold their strength best other ones maybe maybe this one was at the bit that we take the tourists through because there's lights on in there all the time it's that bit brighter it's that a little bit warmer from that mm -hmm. you know all these things make a difference we i think i've told you this before i can't remember i don't think we went as far as going to find it um Andrew, but we... Oh, the con is this about the cognac cast? The cognac. So that's the yeah. funny one. It always goes back to that. Like, that is the dampest corner as far as we know. And there's not even any light bulbs, which is the fun part, if you ever actually want to go and look at those casks, because you need to, you know, go for the old... You know, maybe a lighter back in the day, but now it's the... Uh... Yeah. They, they do need to put a better flashlight on cell phones because it has become a crucial feature we, we really rely on those these days um well, you know I, I was laughing at my mother who didn't realize she had that feature on on her phone because i'm a I, i've told you this before i'm a brass band geek so i was playing christmas carols a lot between the since we last spoke and now i think i've played christmas carols about 10 times and mm. one of the times it was getting dark and my mum said to me, it's going to be dark when you're playing. And it was for her church. She was like, "You, I'll, I'll get a torch and I'll come and shine the torch over your shoulder so you can read it, read the music. And I said, what are you talking about? Go and buy those really big batteries. You know the ones? I'm like, mum, just use your phone. What do you mean? Yeah. Your mum needs phone. to be introduced to the, the wonders of LED technology. Absolutely. I was like, certainly it's not much cheaper than go buying those ridiculous batteries for sure. All you need is a hearing aid battery these days. Um, 
All right, we should keep this rolling. Yeah. Because we like to do what we call the speed round here, Deborah, where we go back and oh, yeah, see yeah, how yeah, they've course, changed. Yeah. So, and I'm not putting that on you. I, I should have mentioned that again at the start, but let's go on to the 1993, where I was just a minute or two ago. Um, find that screen again. Ooh, it's fudgy. It is fudgy. I like these ones. Mm hmm. My sweet tooth is like, hmm. All right. Put this this is what I'm thinking. Screen. It's just past Christmas and I've got the good chocolates here. I'm going to crack, up, crack open the expensive chocolates and see if these match, you know? If you did, I believe that would qualify as work expense and then work should have to reimburse you for the chocolates. De Bernadette's I mean, nodding, so I think it's official. As, as nice as that sounds, these ones were a gift from a friend who lives in Paris, uh, so I'm not sure how easy they'd be to replace. <laughs> well, just get John's corporate credit card out and ring her up. <laughs> Corporate credit cards. We don't have those. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, all right. So 1993, 53.8, fourth Phil Sherry butt, or is it? 28 years of age. Um, yeah, this this can't be fourth Phil, is it? Um honestly, it for me it's so much more of the sweetness and not so much of the the kind of typical sherry. It could be. Mm. It's it's certainly like before you know it's definitely third if not fourth, but it's got it's got a nice sort of old school sherry profile uh, yeah. to it. Um, it's soft. The chocolate leather, you know, candied fruits are in there, but there's some softer tones too, as you said. That nice fudgy note coming through. It was when I first opened the bottle. It really hit me like, what are we here? Twenty eight years old. 53.8 so we're, we're we're back up to kind of where you'd expect it to be 413 mm -hmm. bottles 53.8 so that's much more we'd expect it to be um yeah ah that's interesting oh no bottling date i was going to say that that can't be right it's like i, I read the distillation date is the first of august like, don't produce in august what that can't be right but no distills on the 25th of november 1993 mm. So it's always interesting yeah, as well to see the kind of later dates, what cast number they've got to that year to get kind of get an indication as to pure production was at mm -hmm. that time. Yeah, to see. Well, this is this is when some of the industry was starting to recover, starting yeah. to turn their open their doors again. Curiously, it's also when Chivas decided to start shutting things down. Yeah, was, like sort of um, Reval and that kind of thing. Yeah, they were like 10 years behind everybody else, um, which I don't know, maybe is just their corporate policy. I'm I'm not entirely sure. I mean, they went through so many buyouts as well, but that's probably by the time Seagrams were buying them, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think, um, well, they closed Imperial, I think, 97 or 98. Sounds about right, because that later. was definitely around the time the buyouts were all happening. Yeah, and then, then they sold two distilleries to Billy Walker in the 2000s after he, as his son said, went to the pub um, and came back with a Alistair. contract written on a napkin. Those are the stories that he used to tell, which whether they're true or not, they, they're probably, if they're not true, they're better than the truth. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, and then they sold him another distillery about seven years ago. Um, yeah, one of your neighbors. Uh, well when I worked at Avrilauer, of course, it was it was it, people ask how close are they? Well, when Alki and Avrilauer, when they were both Shivas, um, shared a phone network, like it was a low, it was like an internal call up to Glen Alki. Um and when we found ourselves with a situation where a, a lorry couldn't get out of the distillery, it got stuck and it blocked the road in both directions for about an hour. The tractor came down from Glen Alki to try and free it. Um, oh. <laughs> Didn't work. The tractor didn't have enough power. But what what we would call, and you won't know what this is because it's a very Scottish term, the scaffy managed to do it. Oh, scaffy is the garbage truck. Amazing. And the, um, the scaffy had enough power. What kind of tractor was the? Was it? It was a normal. The tractor was a, just kind of a normal sized tractor, but it was a tanker, if I recall, that was blocking the road. I just want to make sure it wasn't a Massey Ferguson because I just want to make sure that it wasn't that your wasn't family. what was letting people down. Yeah. 
Oh, no, I don't think so. Possibly not. Um, well, the 93 is lovely. Uh, I'm quite enjoying it, but I think we need to go to Dark Sherry Town. Yes, just um, for the contrast. Yeah, so we're on to the 2002 next. Um, 2002 along with 2004 has had a high proportion of these dark sherry casts. So they've often been very sought after. Though you, I have to say, you guys were very clever slash potentially naughty this year. Um, What's the Because you, you released um, a 2004 that was a port cask. Oh, we did, was yes, it this we did. Year? Is it on this list here? It must have been this year. Yes, 23s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think people were like, because I've had customers for about a, about five years now. Every time we launch a new 2004, they're like, I want a bottle. And this year I got a few emails that are like WTF, pork cask. <laughs> so, hey. I mean, it's your whiskey. You can release what you want. I was just amused that people were, some people were like almost angry that you released so, the port cask. We talk about the fact that we only mature and share casks and it's it's basically true, but there is the odd other thing. Um, and, it, you know, John Grant's father was a bit more innovative in some ways than John. So he did do the odd thing that John wouldn't do. And one of those things was just for, you know, we could see it. We're all grown ups here. Shits and giggles. He used to occasionally buy other stuff. So yeah. there yeah. are a handful of port pipes at distillery. There are a handful of quarter casks at the distillery. Um, but to actually, the port pipe would change the profile if you were going to use it in a normal bottling it would change the profile too much so it's been used for things like the family series that they released a few years ago for each generation had a different profile mm -hmm. so one of those was port casks um i've got a funny feeling that a lot of the port casks were actually 1981 that they were mm -hmm. first filmed um the one which was done the 2004 was a was a, was a refill was a second fill um but the eight, it was 81 that they were fresh because Every bottling I've seen of you know first old port pipes was eighty one. Um, I've got one sitting through there actually because that's my year. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it was just something that they did for a laugh. You know, it was never going to be a serious part of what we do for maturing our, our our core range. But you know, you've got to confuse people sometimes. You've got to mm -hmm. you know we're never going to be the ones that mix it up the most. But why not yeah. mix it up just a little bit? Well, sometimes people get complacent. And they just assume, and I don't know. And I suppose if if one thing I suppose you could say that it possibly on one level should be endearing to the company that people take ownership of things. And maybe you put a one time you put a port cask out, and a couple of people you know get their panties in a bunch, as it were. Well, it goes wild. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, that's well, why they have the. The riot shields on the police vans in, in the UK. Just in case Glenn Farkless occasionally puts out a port cask. <laughs> it's the worst thing that could possibly happen in the world today, right? Yeah. I I I would not say that. Anyway, back to the back to the 2002, which is it's very sherried. Yeah, it's a hogshead, so it's gonna make it even more intense. Mm -hmm. Um well, we, we didn't you sort of talked heads. about this by mentioning that port casts, or sorry, sherry butts by virtue of being larger, mature things more slowly. So I suppose when you have an active sherry hoggy like this, you know, it's going to mature even more quickly than, and take on more of that character. more Absolutely. At yeah. Younger age. And it's unusual for us to do hogsheads in the 2000s in the family cask range for the very simple reason that the demand for the youngest ones is always the highest. And if we do a hogshead, it, it really limits how much each mm -hmm. customer can buy. So um, to give you an idea of just the rarity of the family casks in general, when this release came out or when the 23 release came out um, in September last year, myself, my colleagues, Ian and Kirsten, we email all our customers with the new list of what we've just bottled. And we tell them you can have 30 bottles of any vintage. 
maximum. But if we've done a hogshead, it's 18. To allow everyone the chance to get at least some of it. And then if there's any left after that, and there's almost never any left if there's a hog, if there's a, if there's a fresh sherry hogshead from 2002, it's going to sell out like that. And the only reason we ha we still have some left is some other people never took theirs. So right. we're grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> we got we got a bit more. Um, because this is yeah, this is a lovely, it's proper rich, sherry. proper sherry. It's prop, but it's proper sherry without being that sort of aggressive new school yeah. style of sherry that you know proper good for the sherry, let's say. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's old school, but it's still, it's a lovely, deep, rich sherry cask. Um, if I wanted to explain to someone what a sherry cask whiskey is, this would be a perfect example, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not so old that it's becoming that really kind of woody, kind of cedary kind of thing. It's much more, It's it's still got that kind of freshness to it, but it's got but the it's, intensity as well. And as rich as it is, it's still, it's quite soft on the palate um nice polished leather tones stewed fruits lots of like dark rich dates figs yeah that's that's a lovely lovely sherry whiskey no flaws either and that's of actually a dangerous one it is dangerous um deb maybe this is something to quickly address um while we're on the note of sherry uh you know i don't see this very often frankly if ever from Glenn Farkless, um, but uh, sulfur, like sulfur is something that happens quite often with sherry cask whiskeys. And I know I'm, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, was convinced by the little mean man in the hat with the sulfury eyes about sulfur, who we don't he's mention by name either. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a wee Englishman that writes a book that. Did he get canceled? He might have been cancelled, yes. Yeah. But, but for many years, we've chosen not to mention him by name. <laughs> um, anyway. Sorry, just give me one second. I, sure. realize I, I, went, I, was, I did the beginner's mistake of plugging in my laptop, like oh. here, but it's not plugged in there. Give me one second. Take, take your time. Um, <laughs> we need that thing where, like, you know, we'll be back in a moment. You know, the that's kind of silly. Anyway, I don't See, have that. No problem at all. Ah, I no back. longer seeing battery is critical, so that's good. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, sulfur sherry can can be a, a like a danger with some whiskeys. Um, I've not encountered many. No, you know, in, you're in from Glen Farkless in a very. Low, I mean, I I've probably had, God, if I were to put a number on it, I must have sampled hundreds and hundreds of different Glen Farkless bottlings by now. Tough I've, to be. I can maybe think of two or three that were sulfured, which is a very, very low ratio for a distillery it, that uses a lot of sherry. It's been um, a good few years as well since it's something that's even been mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. We used to get the occasional kind of, not complaint, but comment on it when I started kind of six years ago. So I guess that would have been things for me kind of like kind of 10 years before that. But mm -hmm. I can't think of the last time it, we ever we got any kind of feedback along those lines yeah but can you like i mean for those who don't know one of the ways it can come into the whiskey is sometimes they'll bur burn a sulfur candle in sherry casks is this something that you guys work to like is through your procuring of casks to avoid like so because because the casks nowadays are much more really seasoned casks versus real sherry casks, you know, um, it, 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 it means that there's almost more like a purity to the casks, maybe that there wouldn't have been mm -hmm. 20 years ago, even 30 years ago. Um, but it's not, as I say, it's not something that we really come across very often at all. Um, it really does but it's a bit like as harmony says you know it's it's a matter of personal taste some people do like that mm -hmm. but some people well, it, go crazy and call it a conspiracy or what can come about it can come about through the grain you know there's there's multiple different ways that it can come about 
And I don't think it's always a flaw, but I mean, there are some times where a cask has been spoiled because they've, they've treated it wrong. And I guess what I'm asking is like, do you ship your casks wet? Like, are they wet fill casks coming yeah. from Spain? Because I mean, that's the preferred way to do it. So then you don't have to take the risk of burning a sulfur candle and then. Yeah, they, um, they do. They, they, they come, there's always still a little bit in them and, you know, they're not quite, and they, they come just as is. Again, the mm -hmm. advantage of getting direct from the one place, that, you know. My, yeah. I, I literally watched them deliver them a couple of years ago and they, they just rolled them onto a sponge off the top of this three-story truck. Mm -hmm. um, and the real fun thing was when John, or actually might be Callum said, Deborah, go and tell the driver he's got to move. He's not, on the right, he's not going the right way. And I'm like, I don't speak Spanish. Oh, but you, you speak French. It's close enough. I'm like, no, that's not yeah. actually how it works. Um, so me trying to remember enough Spanish to tell him that he needs to go down to the left. Go, how do you say that again? Um, because he'd gone the wrong direction. But yes, it is. I think that 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 for sure. We definitely get them all get them all fresh, and it's fresh wood as well. You know, so in terms of the actual wood, it mm -hmm. you know they, they age the wood, they dry the wood, and everything outside for for a while. But it's still quite well young-ish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, lovely. All right, last whiskey, and then we're going to do the speed round. And if she's up for it, we'll. Uh... We'll have Harmony come in to do the speed round for us. She, we weren't expecting her on tonight's tasting, um, so we appreciate her joining us. Um, last whiskey, I'll do a quick intro here and put it up. It is the 91. 91, um, I'm going to let people in a little secret. I think we're past the point where I need to like keep quiet about this, but um, I had a bit of a system for a number of years, and I think we're past the point where I need to keep this to myself where I I could guess based on past releases how certain vintages of Glen Farkless would do. And uh, uh, 91 was one of those vintages that I always kept my eye on. Um, 89, uh, 90 uh, were among them. And I mean, all you have to do is take a look at this bottle to see why. Because not only were these dark, but they were also like, proper good sherry and some of these 89 90 and 91s were also what i would call like a very old school style of sherry whiskey they didn't taste like modern sherry even when it's good like that 2002 is a great bottling that's a more modern sherry but a lot of these tasks from uh that that run 89 90 91 which makes perfect sense with what we talked about before deb the rest of the industry is not even in recovery mode yet. So perfect time for Glen Farkless to buy the best quality sherry cask it can possibly put its hands on. And they were doing um, a lot. Like looking at yeah. this list, this is cast five, six, seven, nine from 1991. And that was from June. That, mm -hmm. so, so 91 must have been a really big production year. To be at 5,000 casks by, by June is crazy. Well, and again, um, ahead of the trend. And I think this is something that I've, I've always loved about Glen Farkless, it being a family owned independent distillery is, uh, you know, you have a different, the, those kind of companies have a different way of looking at cycles and turnover than, you know, your big whiskey companies. You're not worried about paying your shareholders a dividend. Oh, this is a year to invest because casks are probably relatively speaking cheap. Um, Grain is probably relatively cheap because there's not as many distilleries at full production and buying it. Um, so and, let's you know, put, put our foot down. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'm sure William Grant's to an extent is similar, but Gordon McPhail is the classic uh, comparison to this. Like, what was everyone else doing in the early 90s? They were worried about paying their shareholders. Gordon McPhail was buying Ben Romick from Diageo and figuring out how to reopen it. Um, they were buying casts from or buying fillings from people. So it, it's an interesting way that these multi-generational family businesses look at opportunities and timing. 
Absolutely, and it's still it's still true to this to this day. I mean, we were talking about that kind of tipping point where we kind of are just now, where there is definitely a slight slowdown in in certain things in this industry. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we noticed it last year. We did not sell as much as we sold the year before. We don't talk about numbers ever because we're an entirely private company, and I don't even know how much we sold. But I know that it wasn't as much as the year before. But it doesn't matter. In fact, it's probably a good thing for us long term. It's helping us make sure that we end up with a little bit of supply going forward. You know, if we'd kept going like we did the year before, we'd been in trouble in a few years. So we'd have run out mm -hmm. of cash. Yeah. Gives us a chance to rebuild the stocks a little bit. And we don't have that pressure of, oh, but you know, your budget was to do plus ten percent, mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't do that, it's the end of the world. Well, no, it's not. It's 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 fine. You're right, um, though. The style of the sherry is quite, quite different. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I just want to throw, I don't think Harmony got my joke. Um, Harmony, I think you had a wee typo about betting smashed blueberries. So that's why I raised you um, <laughs> nutty sherry. But anyway, um, <laughs> your tasting notes are, are quite good. It's not, there's no blonde. It's just, anyway. Your, your tasting notes are really good, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll have her in for, again for the speed round, but yeah, this is, to me, this is more reminiscent of that old Scott, old style sherry. Yeah. You know, you've got something now that's 32 plus, you know, going on 32 plus years of age. It's it was rich. 31 when it was bottled. 30, cause, yeah. Right. Cause it's not an S23 cause we get those a year later um, because of stuff. Cause of Canada. <laughs> Canada, you know, distances, shipping railroads, ports, all that kind of stuff. Um, Liquor boards. Mm -hmm. your, your friends. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Incidentally, um, we're going to have a great MS Calgary Whiskey Festival next week. Didn't feel like that earlier this week. Um, but anyway, it's going to be great. You should really come. Um, there's going to be over 330 whiskeys available for sampling. Um, and three people have backed out and had VIP tickets. So if you don't have a ticket and want to come and you want a VIP ticket, email me and I'll help you get those tickets. But anyway, um, it's got a lovely profile to it. This is par for the course with some of those great 1991 bottlings, um, rich sherry, really well balanced, um, really digging this one. This one really needs chocolate with it. Mm. Did you open it? No, I didn't. Oh. It feels it feels like a sin to open chocolate that good at one twenty two in the morning. That's fair. That's fair. All right, we've gone through the range. We've got to do a speed round now. If she's up for it, um, I'm welcoming Harmony to come join us on the chat, and I'll make her co-host so she can come. Hey, Harmony. Hello. How, how are you? Are you warm? Where you are? I'm warming up. Yeah. There you go. The walk, the walk home was probably cold. No, it wasn't bad. Um, uh, Sammy gave me a ride, but we didn't have much time to warm the truck up, uh, ah. because he also had things to do. But he uh, dropped me off on the way, which was very nice. That is much walk better than walking dog. home. Yeah, I did have to walk my dog, so it's kind of equivalent to walking home, but uh, it's good. That's fair. It's good. This is a good um, way to work. Sorry to Apple, there is an extreme cold warning for Calgary. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, we don't need to talk about it. It's, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a sore spot, but it, it won't last long and no. it'll get better. All right. We're going back to the 1979, my brother's birth year. I'm getting a yogurt note from this now, Ooh, too, which is really kinda... like that has changed beyond all recognition. I, I'm not one of those guys that does granola and yogurt, but that's what this smells like to me. And I'm not saying I wouldn't eat it, but it's not like my first choice of what breakfast. to do with granola. You're, so this is your breakfast whiskey. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have a like a rich fatty milk in there than the than the yogurt, but that's just me. I'd rather uh, have a pound of chocolate, very... but you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm at the age where I have to make decisions about pastries and whiskey. I can have one, but I can't have both. So, but I mean, you know how often I go to France for work. I can't not. <laughs> but you know what? To be to be fair, and I've had great croissants in France. 
there are some places that have great pao shakala in Calgary. We're going to have to set you up with some proper good pao shakala here. And they're like fr proper French bakeries just in Canada. Yeah. So anyway, still great. Harmony, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the 79? I would agree with you on the nose, like tons of granola and yogurt. Uh, the palate's quite drying, uh, which I wasn't uh, prepared for. Um, mm. But yeah, there's this like nice kind of drying woodiness. Um, mm -hmm. It's grassy. It, it there's almost grassy. like a there's almost like a like tequila like grassy sweetness to it, which is you know you think about a lot of those whiskeys don't have a ton of oak exposure because they're not very old, but uh, yeah, there's a bit of a tropical tone to it, um, and the granola bit it's. It's it's a, a spirit driven whiskey, which is kind of my wheelhouse. So, yeah, yeah, it's good. Cool. Um, nineteen eighty three. Oh, see, I like the nose on this a lot. It's also changed a lot. Right, I just poured yeah. mine like five minutes ago. <laughs> Some, something just occurred to me and I don't want to alarm people that think I've acquired gigantism and I've grown enormously over the last uh, few weeks. I brought mini Glen Cairns with me because they're <laughs> easier to bring yeah. than large Glen Cairns. But, I uh, like the mini uh, ones. You know what? I have to say like they're like proper all the proportions and everything are they're, they're great. I only have two of the good ones. The rest are like distillery visitor center ones. But yeah, I love these little mini ones. <laughs> They're good for tastings when you're, when you're really just doing a small tasting because it, you don't look as cheap as putting them in this size of one and discovering mm -hmm. that it looks like the, you, you've just been really Scottish and stingy. <laughs> and also it makes you look like a giant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Harmony, thoughts on the 83? I love I like the the palette a lot. It's it's I would say more tropical than the first one. Um it just for me I'm just salivating a bit more and it's not from alcohol, it's just from that nice juicy flavor of it. Um it's a bit buttery, mm -hmm. I feel now as well. Yeah. yeah, it it's it is more of a mouth coating experience uh on the whiskey. Uh, what what fill is this? I, I missed this it. This is a third fill hog's head. Okay. Yeah, but I think. It's it's funny, Harmony, because, and I agree with you, but when we went the first time around, the 79 was more tropical. Mm -hmm. So that the 83s opened up nicely over the course of the tasting. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, for me, uh, the, the, the 79 is almost a bit too cheesy for what I was anticipating. Um, mm -hmm. for a family cask, but it's not a bad thing because it, it just shows that within the range, you can get a vast variety of characteristics mm -hmm. that you're not just, you should not expect the same thing from every vintage and you shouldn't anyway in a single cask, but this just proves that there's there's a variety to explore. Mm -hmm. um, on to the 92. Thoughts on the 1992. It's yeah. it's spicy now. It's quite spicy, a bit chocolatey. Um, I'm just checking to see if Evan created a poll for us. Because if he didn't, uh, I don't think he did. Um, well, we'll 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 do an unofficial poll after this. But uh, that uh, the 92, as we were talking about Harmony, I think this is just before you joined is kind of a bit uncharacteristic of some of the other 92s we've seen. It's a little bit less sherried, um, more spirit-driven, which is partly why we decided to put it further up in the lineup. And um, it's it's good. It's uh, like an apple fruit salad, um, mm. heavy on the apples with some nice cinnamon in there for me. Like the McDonald's healthy choice. <laughs> I would like to. I'm assuming people actually order those. Like, I have to assume but they wouldn't like keep the them on the menu forever. Deborah's saying no. Deborah's saying no. Yeah. Who you, you go to McDonald's for the artery clogging? Yeah, you go if for you're bad enough to go there. Don't. Just go there. Don't try to pretend yeah. otherwise. Got it. I agree. You gotta. You gotta own it. I don't yeah, do it very I often. Could go for but when I do it, I think 
I think McDonald's yeah. is still open. Oh, you could probably get them on like Uber Eats if you have that there. Yeah, this is this is Elgin. We don't have Uber Eats, but we do have McDonald's. Oh no, it closes at midnight these days. It used to be open twenty four hours, but okay. a few of our twenty four hour things here are no longer since COVID. Like they they never went back to it. Disappointing. It's closed till six. Well, you're gonna have to start a petition, I think. Absolutely. Um, Thoughts on the 94? Yeah. Ooh, that's gone for me something down the kind of like fickly almost direction. Uh, yeah, I was going to say it feels very spirit driven. Like, mm -hmm. well, it is it's quite spirit driven. It's almost coppery. Like, there's an almost like a, uh, I don't, I, this is, when you go to a distillery and you tour, you can often sample like the new make and you can taste that little bit of copper that's still in it. And you rarely get that, but there's almost a faint copperiness to it. I think you've put it in my mind now, but yes, it is like very minerally in mm -hmm. that way. And I don't want to say iron, but it, there is like yeah. just a hint of that in there for me. Yeah. Iron but leather. Ooh, iron brew. Yeah. <laughs> not really <laughs> there's no they, they do they put iron in iron brew that would be amazing if they did and um, they used to it's like it's like guinness you know it used to be in their slogan but they're not allowed to say it anymore made in uh, scotland from girders <laughs> it should it might be, be some uh, calgary sells iron brew it might be some scottish yeah, i used to be able to buy it at the scottish shop um yeah for, for some reason, I'm sure the level of orange dye in there is like someone in Quebec decided we shouldn't be allowed to have it. I, I'm it's totally sure. natural. That's just the way things work in this country. That's how Yamazaki got banned before people realized it was interesting because Cognac's allowed to have four times as much of a carcinogen as, as Japanese whiskey just because <laughs> someone in Quebec decided that was the case. That's a true story. You, you won't be able to look it up, but I assure you that's how that all played out. Um, where are we here? 1993. 93. Yep. Harmony was making snow houses and playing house in the schoolyard. And, uh, no, not 93. No. no, 93 is when I was diagnosed so 93 and 94 i spent completely oh. in uh, children's hospital oh that is... puzzles and popsicle stick picture frames there you, you probably did get a lot of popsicles so on the plus side <laughs> yeah. um the 93 we're moving into more of that classic sherry profile coming through some mm -hmm. nice fruits chocolate leather yeah big time chocolate and leather for me and like yeah. those black fruits a lot of black fruits. That's a good call on the palate. Licorice as well. Yeah, All right, what about the 2002, the one of the sherry bombs? Oh, it's a, so stewed now. It's so chocolatey. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. This has a beautiful nose. This is like a whiskey that would take me a very long time to drink because uh, you just nose it and forget to drink it. <laughs> What it be? What it be the kind for me where I would have like one dram and then be like, all right, that's good, but I yeah. can't drink that all night. I need something yeah. else. Yeah, and it's also very big on the palate too. Like it's it's mm -hmm. big and heavy uh, compared mm -hmm. to the one before it. All right. Uh, last but not least, the ninety one. Oh man. I really like the contrast between those two. It's it's what mm -hmm. you were saying before, Andrew. It's that kind of like the two different kind of styles of first full sherry. They Modern really versus each other off quite school. nicely. Yeah, and and for just to highlight that, if people again don't quite like this is, I I was lucky. I've been drinking whiskey professionally for twenty years, which is a funny thing to still say twenty years later. Same. But this is what <laughs> sherry cast whiskeys used to taste like. This is what they were like. 20 years ago when they were 20, 30 years old. And it's and not everyone, something we see Because they were going back to when everyone was still direct firing their yeah. stills. and Direct firing and using proper old sherry casks. I mean, there's few people that you get them from consistently these days. Um, and the 2002 is, it's good. It's great. And there's a consumer style that likes that, but that's that newer style. And, and it's 
well done. So yeah, those are both awesome. Harmony, any thoughts on the the ninety one before we ask people for their favorites? Yeah, I, I and I'm almost like afraid to say it because it sounds weird, but uh, maple brown sugar sausages, just like Ooh. a sprinkle of pepper. I don't know if that's a thing, but it probably should be. I make I mean, it. <laughs> um, I had the other day. Uh, it was foie gras with chocolate and Jen. Do you remember what was in the foie gras? Me. Yeah, do you remember what was in the foie gras? It was chocolate and what foie gras? Do you remember? Chocolate foie gras. No, but there was something else in it too. Um, oh, no, sorry. It was chocolate foie gras butter, which okay. doesn't right sound like you'd like it, but it was awesome. Um, Never had that so, one in France. Uh, this, that, this was in Florida. <laughs> I mean, you get both ends of the spectrum, I suppose, down here. Um, <laughs> As I've learned first time. Um, anyway, uh, time for favorites. What I'm going to ask you to do because Evan doesn't didn't create a poll and because I'm not technically able to talk and create a poll at the same time, put your favorites in the chat. Give us your top two or three, whatever you feel like. Um, we'll give you ours. Uh, I'll maybe start with Harmony just because Harmony... You, you're younger than I am, and therefore you. I assume your brain works better and has better <laughs> recall. What were your favorites tonight? That's generous because my father used to say that my blonde roots went deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really uh, liked the the last in 1991, and I did enjoy the uh, 1993 as well. Cool. They are my two empty glasses at the moment. What if you had a third? What would your third? Oh, be? if I had a third, um, the nineteen eighty three was very nice as well. Okay. Deb, I'm putting you on the spot here. That, you... The eighty three right now smells like peanuts. I've got water mm. in my. I'm not sure if everybody else added water, but it's almost more like beer nuts. I don't know what they are. It must be a Canadian thing. Beer nut, well, North American. They're like kind of like sugar and salt crusted yeah. peanuts. Okay, yeah, um, I, can, I can see that. I, th I think they're designed to make you drink more beer, and that's why they're called beer nuts. Ah, because so they're they're sweet and salty at the same time. Mm -hmm. I definitely like try that next time I come across. Um, mm -hmm. I really like the two thousand two. Um, it is very much that kind of modern style, like you say, and I did also like the 94 was it yeah the mm -hmm. 94 yeah cool i i really wanted the 79 to be a standout and i'm not saying it wasn't good but i agree the 83 outshone it but the 91 um the 91 was a rock star for me tonight i'm actually going to go 91 2002 and those who know me know i am not a sherry bomb guy like i don't generally go for the dark sherried whiskeys i like complexity but those two are textbook for me and 83 is my number three um i think those are those were the best the best drams tonight quickly looking through bernadette said 91 93 2002 um roland and richard uh i've got two different messages i got to find the first one here um Richards were the 2002 and the 1983. I like that too. Um, Richard says also followed by the 79. Uh, Joss Happy's got eight, 91, 83, 93, 04. Um, what I love here, and I'm already seeing this, is there's a little bit of everything. People are all over. Um, Herb Evers, I'm just a simple guy. Invite me over and serve me any two or three <laughs> or four. Herb, I know that's not true, but also... Um, I appreciate that you're a guy who probably just likes the experience and that's, there's something to be said for that. Um, what did Eric have from barrel to bottle? Uh, didn't save enough to go back through the lineup. Rookie move. Oh, Eric. Yeah. I guess we probably should invite you to do more of these tastings, but yeah, we, we have the speed round just so that you can make a decision because I'll be honest, I can't remember by the time we've gone through clearly what I, what my favorites were. So yeah, you got to, Save a bit. I sh we should have started with that, I suppose. Um, I'll see if I can find one or two more here. What have we got? Robin and Shannon. I suppose they vote as a block, which is okay. 
Um, but they've got 91 and 93, so that's good. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, I'm proving to be a bit of a rookie with the chat here, scrolling through it. Uh, find one or two more. Um, Jim said 91 followed by the 2002. And let's see, Adam and Adam's got 2002, then the 91. Steve, consistent 91, 93. Uh, whoever was just above that said 79. And anyway, uh, yeah, it's cool to see. We've got people voting all over the spectrum there. So it proves uh, the, the, the age old, you know, there's no such thing as the best whiskey. You know? yeah. There's, yeah. it, it's so, it's such a personal thing. You know, really yeah, well, just proves What well, is a very personal thing. And, you know, speaking as someone who's got more bottles at home than I know what to do with, like sometimes you just know what you want based on your mood. And it's hard to explain to another person which one you want and why. Mm -hmm. And I prefer not to explain. I just prefer to have what I want at that moment, but that's just how things work. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in. I know this is an early tasting, but especially a huge thank you to Deb who uh, has stayed up very late for us. It's almost two in the morning in the UK. So Deb, thank you very much for that. I've got off to a, a, a nightclub now, obviously. I'm clearly yes. not wearing pajama bottoms at the moment. <laughs> yes. Um, even if and you have you ever been to Joanna's, the, the nightclub in Elgin? No. Have you ever had that pleasure? No, no one's ever dragged you there any, any trip you've been on. I, I didn't even know there was such a place. <laughs> oh, there so you go. Next trip over, Glenfarclas Haggis, barrel selection, climbing, climbing over casks, and then pajama party at joanna's is what i've heard so i'm i'm in for all of those things um i also want to say a huge thank you to pacific wine and spirits bernadette's on here tonight they're an amazing partner to work with um we're very grateful to to, to have their support so deb agrees harmony agrees everyone agrees um so thank you to them thank you to all of you don't forget if you're in town next thursday it's not going to be minus 36 it'll only be minus 11 Oh, the MS Whiskey Festival if you don't have tickets already um, because it'll be awesome. So Minus 11 in Calgary is probably like about the temperature we've got here now and, we, and how it feels. Because no humidity, it'll be sunny. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes. Well, Deb, once again, pleasure as always. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy your holiday. Yeah, will do. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night, Harmony. Thanks for tuning in. Bernadette, everybody, uh, enjoy yourselves and we'll talk again soon. Thank you Thanks, all. Guys. Good night.